language. We'll get into that in, in, in just a minute, like right now. Right, let's look down here and get into verse number one and two. Look at the Bible reads. It says, in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. If you notice there, there's four different names mentioned, but it's basically all talking about the same place. It's talking about Judah, Israel, Salem, which is basically Jerusalem. So it's a shortened version. Uh, we're going to go into that also in just a minute. And then his dwelling place in Zion, Mount Zion, uh, also in Jerusalem. And uh, this is, of course, in the Old Testament. And this is just exalting the name of the Lord and, and being the God of Israel and being the, the God of, of these places and where God placed his name and it is a glorious thing. It was a very gr uh, glorious thing. You know, God's name is great in Israel. God is, is known in Judah definitely during these Old Testament times. Unfortunately, in the times that we live now, it's a different God. It's a different name that is known. Yeah, they might try to claim the same name. They might try to claim the name of the Lord and try to claim the God of the Bible but it is not. It is a false God that is being worshipped in modern day Israel, in modern day Jerusalem. It is not the same God. And I want you to turn real quick to Psalm 122. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but again, I think it's important given the events that occur pretty frequently in general, just with all the trouble in the Middle East, with the modern day uh, popular Christian perspective on who Israel is. Uh, there's just a few other passages. I know I covered this on Sunday. I'll cover it a little bit again now with some other passages just to get a good, make sure we have a proper understanding, especially if you're talking to people who are deceived by the modern day nation of Israel and thinking that we must support them because of anything that the Bible says. Now, look, if someone wants to support them for political means or something like that, whatever, right? Like, like I don't even want to argue about the politics of it. And, you know, some people say, well, they've been our allies and we need to su support them because of our interests here in the United States versus that's different. What, what, what bothers me more are the people who want to bring the Bible into this and try to guilt trip Christians into thinking you have to support a godless nation, a Christ rejecting nation in order to be right with God. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And, you know, I, I went over a little bit Genesis 12 on Sunday and, um, you know, where, where the Bible talks, that, where God's talking to Abraham and he says, you know, I'll bless him that blesseth thee and curse him that curseth thee. I literally, so for those of you that, that know, um, if you've been following with the Fire Breathing Baptist Fellowship that Sedfast put on, uh, Pastor Shelley also runs a podcast, it, um, and I was uh, lucky enough to be on that show on Friday, and, um, but I, I showed up a little bit late, so I had missed the beginning part of, of, of the clip where they played a clip from uh, Pastor Greg Locke. And he's in, in Tennessee, I believe. Does it, can anyone confirm that? Can I get a witness? Anyone know? I think, I think his church is in Tennessee. Somewhere not super far from, you know, it's somewhere in the south. Maybe Kentucky. I want to say Tennessee, though. But anyways, that guy got his, at least in my opinion, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not some uh, Greg Locke expert, right? But I, I think he got his popularity, at least, broadly, from his little videos that he would make and put up. And they were mostly political. They were mostly like looking to be kind of edgy, but edgy for the, the Fox News Baptist, right? They were, but they were saying just the same type of thing, the same type of talking points. And he gathered a pretty significant following. Again, I couldn't tell you how much, I don't really know. Um, I would hear his videos a little bit and just kind of be like, yeah, whatever. But in recent times, he's really just gone off the reservation. Now, maybe he's always been that way, and I just didn't know, just because everything I was, I was being put in front of my face was all this more like political type stuff or, or generic Christianity type stuff. But that guy, I, I finally went back and saw most of the video that they, they were showing a clip from for that podcast last week. 
because like I said, I didn't get to see any of it at all. And then I went back because then I was just like, what in the world is going on here? And it was crazy. I mean, literally, like it was a circus, for one, on the stage. And you had these people waving the flags. And they had their rock concert. And he's up there walking back and forth and just saying, like, like I don't know if anything out of his mouth was the truth at all. I mean, everything he said is just, was just false. It seemed that way to me from what I was hearing. And he even, like, he tried to quote the Bible. He says, I will curse them that curse Israel and bless them that bless Israel. Like, that's not what the Bible says. But that's what he said that the Bible says. So, I mean, he, that's just a, a bold-faced lie. I'm just coming out, and, and it's that level of, of deception where people, and the people, oh, yeah, hey, man, you know, everyone's all worked up and, and cheering like it's a political rally. And that's pretty much what it was. And he, but, he, but the worst part is he's just mixing in, trying to mix in all the Bible and getting people to believe that, look, we need to support this nation and this people because somehow the Bible says so and it couldn't be further from the truth. So when we look at a psalm like Psalm 76, where it's like, hey, in Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel, and Salem also is his tabernacle, his dwelling place in Zion, that was true. 100% was true. You know what? God's tabernacle is not in Zion anymore. Not in that physical location, at least. We know that there's a heavenly Jerusalem, and we're going to see a little bit of a scripture about that, too, this evening. That's what really matters anyways. And, that, you know, that's always been what matters the most, even in Old Testament times. But, of course, there was, there was still that physical location that, that did also matter. Like, there was promises made for physically bringing in the children of Israel in that promised land and setting up the tabernacle and God's dwelling place being there. Uh, and when, when Solomon made that great prayer, right, he says, we know, like, like God doesn't dwell in, in, in a building made with hands, but, Lord, you know, have respect unto this place. And when, when we, uh, you know, when, when your people fall into sin and you have to judge us and we're carried away captive, you know, when they humble themselves and pray toward this place, you know, have respect towards that. So there was some emphasis made on that location, on that place, which Again, there's still emphasis in times to come in this physical location in this place. But I'll tell you what, the time is not right now. Because God's tabernacle is not over in the Middle East right now. Um, God, the Lord of the Bible, is not known and worshipped there. He's known because just because I think God's known everywhere, but um, not in the way that this is talking about in an endearing way about the dwelling place of the Lord being in this place. And uh, if I turn to Psalm 122... This is another popular verse that people will like to, to use in addition to Genesis. Uh, one, Psalm 122, verse number 6, the Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot more there. We're going to read more of this. But people say, see, look, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we need to be praying for Jerusalem. And, and that's, that's kind of where that stops. But we need to understand why, why. First of all, why should we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? And when we get Psalm 122 in context, we can see Exactly why the psalmist is saying, hey, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. So if they say, if they say that, just, just right away, it's like, okay, well, is this talking about this physical place right here? Is it modern day Jerusalem? Let's see. Verse 7 says, peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee. So he started off saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but now it's getting a little bit more detailed. Well, for my brethren and companions' sakes. Well, his brethren, you could say, oh, well, that's the physical Jews. Well, hold on a second. But then the next verse says, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. The house of the Lord our God is not in that place anymore. Again, so yeah, if Jerusalem was still the place where God had his name, still continuing to be brought forward and God's pro the prophets of God were still coming out and preaching to that people and God still had that nation established as the nation he was using to bring forth his word, then I would still say, yes, this applies. But the problem is we, we also have scripture 
even in the Old Testament, and turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 14, where you already can have a, a seeming contradiction. So like if, if Psalm 122 is literally just carte blanche, pray for Jerusalem always. You just always have to pray for Jerusalem and then you'll prosper, right? And then God will bless you. If that's what that says and if people are gonna teach that that's what that means, then you've got a problem dealing with other scriptures. It, then I, I would say you also, you know you have a problem with, you have a problem with God. Because I'm pretty sure that Jerusalem was destroyed and that was because God brought judgment on Jerusalem. Like that God brought that in. Jeremiah 14, look at verse number eight. The Bible says, Oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in time of trouble. Why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Why shouldest thou be as a man astonied, as a, man, a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Thus saith the Lord unto this people. Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. So we have the people saying, hey, you know, don't leave us. We're called by your name. But then God is responding saying, look, this people, my own people, they love to wander. They love to stray and, and get away from me. And it says the Lord doth not accept them. That God doesn't accept you. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, verse 11, pray not for this people for their good. But I'm supposed to pray for Jerusalem. Pray not for this people for their good. Now, again, you can't just take this verse and say, see, it's never right to pray for this people for their good. No, it's because of the things that, the, that they're talking about here. There are plenty of times in the Old Testament where you should be praying for their good, but then there's other times when you shouldn't be praying for their good. There's, there's times when you ought to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, but then there's other times where you shouldn't be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Does that make sense? Like, but it's, it's all dependent on where the people are at at that time. If they're in obedience and submission to the Lord, yeah, amen, pray for the blessing, pray for the peace, pray for God's protection, pray for all the good things to come upon that people whose God is the Lord. But when they stray, when they wander, when they set up the altars to Baal, when they go in and defile the house of the Lord, when they go in and do all this wickedness, then you don't pray for their good and pray for God's blessing on that people. I mean, doesn't that just make sense? Like, do you need a, a theology degree to understand these simple concepts of, of people being right with God or people not being right with God? But today, somehow, it's gotten brainwashed into certain people in the Christian churches that you just always are just supposed to bless this people no matter what they do. And that is ridiculous. And I would say that's hateful. It really is hateful. It's funny because I'm the anti-Semite, right? And I, look, I'm saying that jokingly. I don't care what nationality anybody is, right? If someone's from Shem is Semitic, that doesn't matter, okay? But that's the label that I'll receive because I preach that the Jews aren't anything special. They're not the special chosen people from God and they have some special pass into heaven or that we need to treat them any different. And that Judaism is in fact one of the most wicked religions in the entire world, an antichrist religion, and, and really that religion ought to be stamped out. I'm not saying all of the people ethnically who are Jews need to be stamped out. I'm saying the religion ought to be eradicated because it's a wicked, antichrist, satanic, 
Luciferian religion. Literally. Synagogue of Satan. Okay? But so that will get me in trouble with the world. And that's fine. But that's the truth. And people need to hear the truth. And I, and I would hope and pray that people who are sucked in to that false religion, just as much as any other false religion, would hear the truth, would get stung by the truth, that the word of God would pierce through even the dividing of soul and spirit so that they can get cut right to the heart and maybe the stony heart can be pierced and be left with a soft heart and one that's going to turn to Christ. One that could turn away from that wicked religion and accept Christ as their savior. That's ultimately the goal. But see, that's not going to happen if you continue to just prop them up and say, oh yeah, yeah, you guys are, you're God's people. I know you don't, you don't, you reject Christ and you don't receive uh, the things of Jesus Christ, but you know what, that's fine. That's a hateful thing. Because you're not doing anything to help that person see the light and get saved. Because every unbelieving Jew is going to go to hell when they die. Just as every unbelieving Gentile is going to go to hell when they die. Because there is no difference. It doesn't matter. Unbelievers all die and go to hell. So when we, whether we call out Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or Catholicism or Hinduism or Judaism... They're all going to die and go to hell if they don't change what they believe and put their faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what they need to hear. We don't need to be defending any one of those groups of people as being special people because they're not. None of them are. And you can't go to the Bible then and try to say, oh, see, look, we need to be praying for Jerusalem. We, you know, God's name is great in, in Israel. Yeah, it, it is. Now it's the Israel of God, which is not the physical seed but it's the seed of the promise. Look at verse number 12. So, so verse 11 again said, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and, a, and, and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And that, that reminds me of another thing that, that Greg Locke was saying, all this stuff like, you don't know who you're messing with and God's going to come and he, you're going to see that God. Is, you know, like, like he's prophesying what's going to happen to Palestine, right? Or, or Hamas or whatever. Like, like he's just, he's saying all this stuff that what God's going to do because you don't know who you're messing with with Israel but it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And just because the prophets say you shall not see the sword and you won't have famine, like they were saying in Jeremiah's day, right before they were taken captive, right before they were besieged, right before they did see famine and everything else, all the prophets were saying, no, no hey, we're good. God's going to step in. God's going to defend us. God's going to bless us. Uh, no, he's not. You don't even have the right God. Verse 14 says, then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. And this happens today too. You got Greg Locke going up and prophesying lies in the name of Jesus Christ. But just because he's trying to use the name doesn't mean he's actually of Jesus Christ or of the Lord. He's just prophesying lies. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Turn to go to Hebrews chapter 7. I want to go in just real briefly on this uh, other aspect now. That's, that's about all I want to say about, about the whole, you know, Israel thing. I thought it was appropriate because those first two verses in Psalm 76 are bringing up all these different names and it's uh, recognizing the glory and honor of God being the God of this place. And the rest of this psalm still follows that context. It's, it's really good to understand that, but it's also understand the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's understand, important to understand when we should bless people and when we should not bless people. 
Now, I mentioned Salem is basic, essentially it's a shortened for, uh, form of Jerusalem, but Salem itself is only used a few times in the scripture. And um, I just want to show you here what that word Salem even means, which is, again, even just in itself is pretty interesting and pretty cool. That word Salem means peace. So, and that's a biblical definition, not a dictionary definition, right? I don't know if you would necessarily get the same definition in a dictionary or Hebrew dictionary or anything like that. I don't know. But uh, the biblical definition, we, we get this clearly from Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which, by the way, in Genesis, when it references this story, when this story originally appears in the Bible, uh, that's like the only other time we see references to Salem. So we've got this one reference in Psalm 76. We've got the references in Genesis and then Hebrews, which is talking about that. So it's, it's only mentioned a few times in Scripture. The rest of the time, when we look at the city, it's Jerusalem. So um, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So it literally clarifies and says, he's the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Just like Jesus Christ, Christ means Messiah, right? Which is being interpreted Messiah or the Christ, right? So, so those words literally mean the same thing, just like Salem and peace here are clearly referring to the same thing. And, um, it says, and then it says in verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. And that's talking about Melchizedek. I'm not going to go into um, that too deeply, but we know already Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, Right? A prince and king can oftentimes be used synonymously. Uh, he's the king of peace, just as he's the king of Salem, as Melchizedek here. And Jerusalem is uh, the, the city that has significant import in general in biblical history, as well as even going into the future. There is going to be uh, the new Jerusalem, right? And that will be a city of peace as well. And that is where... Uh, the Prince of Peace is going to reign from. So, anyways, let's continue in Psalm 76. So, verse 3 starts off, There break he the arrows of the bow. There meaning Judah, Salem, Jerusalem, Israel, right, where God's land for, for his people, the land for his people. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle, Selah. Um, I would say, you know, whether that be, I would say that's probably referencing the defense of Jerusalem, the defense of that city, but it's showing God's involvement there and, and not allowing people to uh, destroy his place. So when God is with you, obviously it's very good to have the Lord as your defender to save you from any uh, armaments that might come against you, any foreign powers, any civ uh, any anything that's going to come your way. Verse 4, thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. Uh, so there, we're going to get into a few verses here that it's a little bit, might seem a little bit odd. You might be scratching your head going, well, what does that mean? Because they're definitely not phrases or words that we often use together, mountains of prey. But when you just take a second and look at it and think about it for a minute, it's not that difficult to understand either. So I'm just going to go over this real quickly. Uh, it's obviously poetic language. It's a psalm, right? So it's a song, and uh, words are put together a little bit different when, when you're dealing with poetry. But uh, ultimately, what is this doing? It's exalting the Lord, right? Because it says, thou art more glorious, more excellent than the mountains of prey and the mountains oftentimes is symbolic of nations or kingdoms or really mighty kings, really mighty nations, right? Because they're high, they're lifted up. But he's saying that the Lord is more glorious and more excellent. You say, well, why are they in the mountains of prey? Well, because you've got predators and prey, right? The prey are those that are going to be eaten and swallowed up and defeated. So they may seem really mighty and powerful in these high mountains, but they're really the prey for the Lord because their arms won't stand against God. 
and God is way more glorious and way more honorable and way more powerful and is much more exalted above the highest of those mountains of prey. Um, verse 5, and this is still coming off the, the, the idea of God defending Jerusalem and, and that name of, of Jerusalem being great, right? Uh, let's see, verse number 5. The stout-hearted are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. And again, this isn't the way that we would normally talk, but let's go through this real quickly. What does this mean? Stout-hearted are the brave. Okay, they have a lot of courage. They're courageous people. But it says the stout-hearted are spoiled. So they are spoiled to be like they're defeated. Okay, they're, they're, they're taken advantage of. They have slept their sleep. Obviously, sleep could be referring to their death, or it could just be referring to God making them just very ineffective. Right, so whether they're sleeping their sleep because they're dead, it says none of the, the mighty men, the men of might have found their hands. Right, so just another poetic, interesting way of saying that, like, they're just not able to fight. They're mighty men, they should be ready to go and strong for the battle, but God has made it so that they can't fight. Like, their arms are just kind of become useless, their weapons are breaking or whatever, and they're just not able to function that normally they would be able to, but because God is protecting his people, they're just, it just things just don't work out for them. And, you know, there's so many instances in Scripture where God is defending his people and God is just, just causing uh, havoc on the enemies even without any involvement from his people, right? Like um, when, when oh, I forget what battle that was, when the, when the invading armies woke up and they saw what, it was in King's, it might have even been Jehoshaphat and Ahab. I think there was the three kings, and then they were, you know, Ahab's like, oh, we're going to die for thirst. If you remember that story, he said, God brought these three kings together, which God didn't, by the way. Like, like they were going off to fight this battle, and then, and then they're finally out there, and then there's no water, and then they're like, well, is there, some, is there a man of the Lord that we can inquire of? And that's when Jehoshaphat, uh, they find... Uh, Maybe Elisha or Elijah, like, like one of the prophets. And he's just like, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be talking to these guys at all, right? And then uh, they said, he prophesied, they're going to you know, dig ditches, and then they're going to have the water. And um, then when the invading army saw the water, it looked like blood to them. So they thought that like, oh, yeah, man, they killed, uh, they all died or whatever. But then uh, God brought that great, great victory and, you know, there's, there's many other examples where things, like supernaturally, things just kind of happen, where God works it all out. So while he's taking care of who he wants to raise up and lift up, then he's also bringing down those that he wants to have destroyed. And it would look like, oh, this is just some great coincidence, but of course we know that it's not. God's hand is in all of that. So what we see here in Psalm 76 is just these people, you know, the mighty man, their, their, their hand isn't working and the, the, um, the people are kind of in a deep sleep. Verse number six, at thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. Again, just rendered useless. The chariot, the horse would normally be, uh, very desirable weapons to have in a battle, in a war. They're much more effective. They're able to do a lot more damage than just a foot soldier. But they come to naught. They come to nothing. They're, they're cast into a dead sleep. And wh again, whether that could be referring to their death, being killed, or just rendered useless, either way, it's the same outcome as a result of them coming against the, the, the God of Jacob, as it says, at thy rebuke. Uh, the chariot and the horse are, into, are cast into a dead sleep, which all the more reason to just keep this in our minds and remember when you're facing an enemy, when you're facing someone that seems super powerful and super mighty and seems to have all the power against you, God has more power than all. And there is no arm of flesh that can defeat the Lord. 
and we have to call out on the Lord to save us, to be with us. Obviously, we need to call on the Lord to save us for our own souls to be saved, but also we call out on the Lord to save us in our times of need and trouble when we are experiencing uh, this, you know, these foes, these uh, enemies that want to destroy us because God can and will deliver. Verse number seven, thou, even thou art to be feared and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry. So we know that God is a God of long suffering and mercy and God allows his mercies are great and they allow for a lot of infractions and for people to kind of do things without him uh, coming down and raining down on the people. And real, and honestly, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I know just from my own experience, whether it be my life or even just witnessing other people, God is really long-suffering and merciful. Like, he really does allow and give space for people to repent. Like, he, he, he offers that and allows for things to be done. And you th just think about the level of humility that requires to not take everything personally, every infraction, every sin, because of all people, God has every right to just be angry every second that you do anything wrong because he's like, I already told you this. And with us, it's probably going to say, like, I've told you this how many times, right? And you're still not listening. Like, what's the matter with you? And, and we have to remember that. One, one as parents, we should be mindful of that with our children, right, so that we can show grace and mercy similar to our Heavenly Father can show grace and mercy. But also just in, in our own humility, dealing with other people and being able to forgive other people their sins and their trespasses, understanding that, hey, if God's really sh giving a lot of space, right, just, just letting people kind of work it out and do whatever before he really comes down, we ought to be able to have that same level too. And then finally, also just to love the Lord that much more for giving us the ability and the space to get things right when we do fail, right? Now, we don't know how long, God, you know, where, where that breaking point's gonna be before God just wants to come down on us and, and chastise us for our infraction. So obviously, we don't wanna get the attitude where we could be taking advantage of God's long suffering because if you have that type of mindset, you won't get the mercy and the long suffering. If you just think you could like, well, God's just long suffering, so who cares, whatever, I'm just gonna do, I know I could get away with this for a while. You have that attitude, you will get a swift rebuke. I'm telling you, that that's just the way it's gonna work. And, and re relating that again to the home, if I think to start to think that my kids try to find, they found the, the point at which they can go to before they would receive some correction, that's the time when you need to just go <laughs> the next time they try getting to that point. No, you're, you're, you're going back a little bit, right? You, and it, it's not to get too comfortable thinking you know all the boundaries, right? You need, you need to go and don't do the things you know you're not supposed to do. Right, because what, what the point is, they do the things that they know they're not supposed to do, but then they, they know how far they can push it before like, okay, now I'm gonna get a spanking. Now it's like, no, you need to, you need to get a reset there and, and not think that you can get, go to that line. And we don't wanna be the same way with the Lord, right? With our own sins, with our own infractions, thinking that we can just, eh, I could do this, this is okay. I could, I could, I could commit this sin and, and God's, God's merciful, right? No, just, just humble yourself. Thank God for his mercy and giving you the space to repent, but, but have the heart that's seeking to always be repentant for your sins and to get things right. But then, all that said, verse 7, it says, And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Because what you never want to do is get God angry. That's, that's a, you don't want to have to deal with that, right? Like, like be thankful when God is not angry and is just being long-suffering and merciful because once you get on that other side, it's not going to be good for you at all. 
And who can stand before the Lord? I mean, who can stand? Who can stand before God? People who have been righteous people, men of God, fall flat on their face even just in the presence of the Lord when he's not angry. Right? Like when, when any man of God is confronted with the Lord and with the power and the might of God, they fall down like they're dead. And they're not even like actively in any sin or have any reason that, that God would be like coming down on them. They're just in his presence. So if that's how people are going to respond to being in the presence of the Lord, you really want to make sure you're not getting God angry with you. And willfully sinning is definitely going to do that. Definitely going to do that. Now, obviously, in the context here, it's referring to the people who are going to come against God's people, you know, um, God's to be feared. And, and the world is always in, this nation was in a much better place when people had more respect and fear for the Lord. I mean, even the unsaved, right? Like when, when more people had regard to the Bible, to the word of God, when people cared a lot more about like the things you would say even in church or what someone might say about the Bible, there was just more regard, more respect, more fear of the Lord from a nation that was serving the Lord much more broadly, whereas we're getting to the point where no one cares about anything and, and it's all just, there's just blasphemy spoken and no one cares. And what that shows me is that there's, you know, people are increasingly disregarding the fear of the Lord. It's just not there anymore. And when that happens, God needs to bring the reminder of why you need to fear the Lord, because God is not mocked. He's long-suffering and he's merciful, but at the end of the day, he's going to be like, look, you, you know, I'm only going to put up with this so long. I just, I want you to repent before I have to come down and do this. But one, once, once, I'm, once that switch is flipped, it's not good. So have that fear in advance without having to go through it and be brought down and be abased. Verse number eight, thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. And this is when God's judgment is coming down. Now it's too late. And that's all of a sudden, you know, God's judgment is heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, Selah. So why is God saving the meek of the earth? Because you've got a bunch of wicked people in high places and powers that are coming down against the meek of the earth. So God's coming down to defend, and those people have no regard, no fear of the Lord. They don't care about God's laws, and they don't care about God's rules, and they think they can get away with anything they want. And then God's judgment comes. And you know what? Yes, the judgment is a very good thing. God's judgment is a great thing. I mean, it's God's judgment that's saving the meek of the earth. Praise the Lord. That's good. It's not good for those that don't fear God, but it's good for the meek, it's good for the humble, it's good for God's people, for sure. Verse 10, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. And this is a really, I don't want to call it a weird verse, but it's, again, it's another one of those verses that might be kind of hard to be like, what is this talking about? The wrath of man shall praise thee, you know, if, if man's angry, how is man praising God? But it's not, it's not what the, ra the, the angry man is saying that's praising the Lord. It's that the mighty and powerful now are full of wrath and anger because God is judging them and because judgment has come down. That's what glorifies God, is that these mountains that are now the prey have had the tables turned on them and the heathen are raging, that brings glory and honor unto God because God is bringing them down. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the, you know, the wrath of man. It's not, it's not that man is angry, angrily praising God. It's the fact that they're wrathful because of the judgment coming upon them that brings the glory and brings the praise unto God, just, just inherently that happening to them. And then it says, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. So uh, God will, will deal with that and put an end to that, that. That remainder of their wrath will be um, controlled. It will be restrained. Verse number 11. 
Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. So when you vow, you pay. And I, I think the reason why this is even being brought up in this psalm, and turn if you would to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, is because when people are in trouble, and when cities are in trouble, and when nations are in trouble, oftentimes they're going to make vows unto the Lord. God, I'm sorry. God, I'll never do this again. God, if you save me, I will make sure that I will serve you. God, if you save me, I'll go to church every week. God, you get me out of this jam. I was, you know, people make vows when they're in trouble. It's just a fact. It's what happens. Now, the Bible teaches that it's better to not vow at all than to vow and not pay, right? And that there's nowhere in the scripture that just says and commands you have to make vows unto God. But people do. And look, I've done it before, right? Anyone else done that before? Yeah, okay, like, like and, and I've done it before when I was in a jam. God, please, I promise, if you get me out of this, I won't ever do this again. I've done it. Now, there's been times where I think I've broken my vows, but there's definitely times where I've still kept the vow. But here's the thing now, once you open up your mouth to the Lord, like, you, you have to keep that now. I mean, that God expects you to keep that, that vow that you've made, and what, whatever that may be. I mean, especially you say something like, I'll never do that again. <sighs> be careful and be mindful of the words that come out of your mouth. No matter how bad things are, if you're going to say something to the Lord it, to the effect of, I will never again, man, you better, I, I mean, you better make sure you keep that vow. It's better not to make that vow, at least not that way, because God holds you responsible for the words that you say. Look at verse number one, Ecclesiastes chapter five. The Bible says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. And oftentimes, vows can be sacrifices of fools. Where people just don't even know what they're saying and what they're doing, and they just say something. And, you know, for God really just wants you to have the mindset and the heart where you're just ready to listen and receive from him more than offering up whatever sacrifice you're going to vow to God. Be not rash with thy mouth, rash is not like a skin rash. It means you're, you're, you're too quick to say things with your mouth, where you're just, you're just allowing things to come out without thinking about them first. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Control your mouth, especially before the Lord. Just control your mouth. It really will get you out of a lot of trouble if you can just not utter anything and, and not allow your heart to be hasty, right? And, and what does that mean? When you have emotions evolved, involved, when you got people coming against you, maybe your pride gets hurt and you're, you, you could be so quick to say things. Have control over that. Control your mouth. Be not, be, let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Basically, the more you talk, the more likely you are to be saying foolish things. And that's just a fact. It's a fact. And that goes for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, just, you just keep opening up your mouth, you keep talking, blabbing, just letting your gums flap. There's a lot more opportunity to say things that are foolish. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. The Bible calls you a fool if you vow something to God and you don't pay it. You are a fool. That is a foolish thing to do. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. So don't let your mouth write a check that your body can't, can't cash, right? Don't, don't be saying these things 
where he's saying don't let your mouth to cause your flesh to sin because that is a sin you're going to get yourself into a world of hurt when your your mouth is just saying these things and making these sacrifices and making these vows to god and then you don't pay neither say that before the angel oh it was an error oh i made a mistake oh i didn't mean to say that look man it comes out of your mouth and you're responsible for it you can't pull back and retract words once they leave your mouth you just can't it, it's impossible Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Do you want God coming down on you and destroying your work? Then watch what you say. Watch what you vow. For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. And, I, and, I, and I want, I'm going to stop with that verse and we go back to Psalm 76. But because that's still a theme that we're finding in Psalm 76 is having the fear of the Lord, having the fear of God. We've seen God having his place in Jerusalem at the beginning of Psalm 76 and God's uh, mighty defense of that place. And then the foolish people that come against it, they don't have the fear of God. They don't care. They have no regard for it. But then God's going to show himself strong. And then God will come and save the meek of the earth. And then that reminder in verse 11 from Psalm 76, vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. Bring the, yeah, God's worthy of the gifts and the presents. But he's saying, look, you made a vow, now you pay. God's delivered you, show your gifts, show your sacrifices to him, right? Uh, he ought to be feared. Verse 12, he shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. And I've got a few other passages I want to look at just along these same lines that, are, that coincide with uh, the, the spirit of Psalm 76 as well. There's, there's other places that kind of reference things very similarly. Look at Psalm 2. Just flip back to Psalm 2 real quick. God cuts off the spirit of the princes. He, he's going to bring them low, however, how high and, and lofty and you know, they're lifted up in themselves and in their might, and God just cuts them off. And he's terrible to the kings of the earth. Terrible meaning he instills terror. People are, the kings of the earth will be terrified by the Lord. They don't start off that way, right? They didn't in this chapter. They think they're, they're so great and high and mighty and they're full of themselves. But when God comes down to judge, when God comes down to save, when God comes down to make himself known, that's when he's terrible to the kings of the earth. That's when they're going to understand the terror and the fear of the Lord. It needs to come down and uh, uh, to be experienced. Look at verse number one of Psalm 2. The Bible says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So we see here the, the, the kings of the earth being referenced again. But this is, again, at the beginning, the heathen, the kings of the earth, they're just set against God. They don't care about God at all. They have no regard for the Lord. And they're just going to do what they want to do. In fact, they're going to fight against the things of God. Verse 3 says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. So God just thinks it's funny that these kings of the earth think they're so powerful that they're going to do anything against the Lord. It's comical. It's a joke. And it is a joke because the thing formed, talking to him that formed it, like, what? Like, I made you. You think you can do anything against me? Like, that's ridiculous. But then look at this, it says, verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So yeah, at first he finds it kind of funny, but then he deals with them. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And there we have Zion mentioned as well, like we did in Psalm 76. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. 
Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Who can stand before the Lord when he's angry? Right? Isn't that the thought that we also saw in Psalm 76? Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. One other place, Hebrews chapter 12, bringing it all back to Zion. These themes are found throughout Scripture, so especially in the book of Psalms. There's always it's very thematic and, and uh, a lot of basic truths that, that are found many multiple places in Scripture. But I like finding those connections still, too, uh, because then you, could, you can still search them out more. And hopefully you take some notes and then you go back home because there, there's always more to learn, especially when you start seeing more of these connections. And you'll find, I could guarantee you, if you go home and study this stuff, you'll find more, a lot more things that I didn't even bring up that I might not have even seen, right? But, but I'm trying to offer up a little, bit of, a little bit of spiritual meat here and doing some of the work for you and tying together these passages that clearly are very closely related so that you can also go back and study them out a little bit more and find more uh, uh, similarities and learn just some more truths about this subject. And you say, well, it's a real basic subject. Yeah, I know, but there's just so much to learn and to absorb. And even some of the most basic truths, look, how old am I? How old am I? 40 something? 23, 40. How old am I? 46. I, I have to do the math. I, don't, I know my birth year. It's hard enough to even remember what year it is. So, okay, 46 is not that old. Well, they don't say anything. <laughs> If you disagree, you could, you, could, you could just do me a favor and keep silent, all right? I don't think it's very old. But the older I get in the years that pass, it's, it's amazing just how much, one, how much wisdom there is in the scripture, but even some of the most basic things, like basic truths, how much you can continue to learn about even some relatively rudimentary things but, but the more you study and the more you learn, you kind of see, I don't know, more broadly, you, 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 can, you can see how it plays out better, more clearly, like the way things work in this world. And, and you can, you know, the, the more of this, you know, like I said, even the basic things, even just like Psalm 76, it's a very basic understand it's not super deep or super complicated in what it's teaching right and it's something that's found throughout scripture but the more you experience the more you see out in the world there's just so many more angles that you get to understand than from God's word on some of these most simple basic things and I, I just bring that up because I don't want anyone getting to the point where you think like, oh, yeah, well, it's just about this again or something, you know, and kind of what you're going to do is you're going to turn off your brain or you're going to turn off your heart because if you think you have this know-it-all attitude, then why is God going to show you anything more? So don't ever, and, and even, look, if you go and visit other churches, I know some, you, you, you'll probably find a lot more repetition, and I've experienced that, but if you go in ready to hear, ready to learn, God can open up your understanding. I remember going to churches in the past, before I was even a member of Faithful Word, and going to the churches where they might just read one verse and then talk for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and then that's all you get. But I, when, when I would go, because this, this wasn't always, but when I would go ready to learn and ready to, to, to hear, oftentimes something would be said that would be triggering something else, or I'd be looking down at my Bible and kind of reading a little bit more into the context, and I'd walk away learning more. And the same can be said, I believe, just 
in general, when you're going to seek the truth from God's word and you don't have the bad attitude, you have the right attitude, you say, well, it's John 3.16, I know everything about John 3. Do you really, though? Do you really? Even a simple verse, it, like, you'd be amazed. And if you haven't experienced it, then just keep reading, keep studying, because I guarantee you will. So many passages that you think were just super clear, you just understand it, and you understand the service meaning, and it's just like, well, yeah, of course. Well, how many times can, can we go over this? There is more to learn. There is more. And, and there's more that you see ring true, and there's more. The more you get God's word in your heart, the more it helps you in your decision making, the more it helps you to see things in this life and the direction that other people are going, the direction that you need to go, the direction that the world's going, and, and literally understanding all of these things and having God's word more in your heart and more refreshed and going over, hey, if God is bringing things up frequently, then that means it's just that much more important for you to have in your head and in your heart. So yes, can the Psalms be kind of repetitive? Yes, they can. But that means that we need that repetition in our minds and in our hearts to help us in our life. So, I, I mean, I, I hope that you, you feel the same way and you get, you get the excitement out of the Scripture and the Word of God. Because there is so much here. There's so much. I encourage you to, to look up some of these other passages. Some of these I'm just reading through really quickly. And there's a lot there. There's a real lot here. And I just, I literally don't have time to, to run down every rabbit trail of, of the cool things and connections you can make between these passages. So last place we're going to look at, I know we already got done with Psalm 76. Hebrews chapter 12 has some more insight into the same subject material that we got from Psalm 76. <coughs> we're going to start reading there in verse number 18. The Bible reads, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. So what is the mount that might be touched and burned with fire? Mount Sinai, right? Where the law was passed down, where they saw that great fire on top of the mountain, where Moses went up, received the Ten Commandments, right? And if, even if an animal was to touch the base of the mountain, they're going to pierce it through with a dart, Right? Verse 19, in the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. So it says, ye are not come unto that mount, by the way, just in verse 18. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Again, referring to everything that happened with Moses. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So before we continue reading here a little bit more, this is the New Testament application of Psalm 76. Psalm 76, look, I'm not arguing that it's talking about Jerusalem and Israel and, and Zion of the day and of the time and, and where God had his name placed. And, and yes, that is the primary application of Psalm 76. And that was the place where people go. But look, we're in the New Testament now. One stone is not left upon another. The temple's been destroyed. God has removed his name from that place. It's not there anymore. Those are not the people of God. But a people who were not called the people of God now are called the people of God. Because, look, that, that, that olive tree, that branch has been plucked off. And others have been grafted in. Let's keep reading here. This, this, is, this is the New Testament view. This is what we look for. It's about the heavenly Jerusalem, about that Mount Zion, not the one that physically was there that was on fire and we got the commandments from, but no, the heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. 
For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, and who was it that refused him that spake on earth? Much more shall not we, I'll just let you answer that for yourself. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Oh, it's the Jews, all right? <laughs> it's the Jews. <laughs> Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And look, the, 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 the teaching is always there. Look, don't let yourselves get lifted up. Just because the Jews were broken off, just because Israel was replaced as a nation, just because that happened to them, don't just let that get to your head and think, oh, yeah, we're so great and we're so much better because God could just as easily replace you. And don't forget, you need to serve the God, our God, with fear because our God is a, is a consuming fire. Like, don't forget who God is, Ever. The world at large, yeah, absolutely. But you know what? Believers too. Don't get so lax and comfortable with the Lord that you forget that our God is a consuming fire. Yeah, we better just serve him acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. And that'll keep you humble and not get all full of pride and lifted up in yourself. See, a people that just thinks that they're just so special, you're going to start losing the reverence. You're going to start losing the respect. You're going to start thinking that you are so special and you're lifted up and God warns against that. No, stay humble. Remember, our God's a consuming fire. He's a God of love, but he's also a consuming fire. He's both. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all the wisdom found in scripture, Lord. Please, so many times as I study and read, dear Lord, I just feel like I'm just barely scratching the surface and God, um, Obviously, we could only handle so much of the truth. I pray that you would please work with us, continue to work with us, Lord. We thank you for long suffering. Thank you for your mercy, dear Lord. We struggle against the flesh every day. Please help us to get the victory over the sin in our life. Please open up our understanding to your word. God, show us the deep things of your word. Help us to understand and um, to also then be able to teach others and, and to continue to, to spread your word as the truth and um, to bring more people to Christ. God, thank you so much for this church and for everyone here. God, please bless our church. Help us to grow, build this church, dear Lord. And um, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.